things. Yeah. So this is weird because I, I posted this video from the Christian Times new, newspaper, right? And, you know, one of my really good friends has a sister who I guess is very liberal and I never knew. So I guess she caught wind of some of the posts I had about, you know, conservative stuff. Because, you know, obviously liberals don't like the way conservatives believe. Mm -hmm. So one of the things was this big, um, you know, all these regulations they're trying to put in place for like these huge amounts of vaccines that they want, like 20 something vaccines they want kids to take. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is they want your child by the time he's in, in like six months? No, not six months. Six years old before he's before he starts school, has to have like twenty vaccines. It's outrageous. So anyway, I've been poking around and looking at, you know, what big pharma and the motivation behind these vaccines and just. <sighs> It's incredible. I look at all the, in, in the 1980s, when these things started, the, the, the pharmaceutical companies have been ha held harmless for vaccines. In other words, you can't sue them for problems with vaccines. And they, they just, anyway, she um, started looking at my posts. <laughs> so she took this post about, a uh, VA, uh, a vet that was beat to death in Philadelphia by the, and it's in the Christian times, but she found it on that Snoop's site to be false. But I also found out that Snoop's has been um, shielding liberal things as well. And um, I even think that there was some connection between the nonprofit that Soros has that supposedly is paying into snoops to keep certain things under wraps. So, you know, you can't know, you don't know who to believe anymore. It's just Well, that's the problem. Um, I think I mentioned to you that two of my friends over the years, one of them's passed on now. Um, he was the evangelist, I think I mentioned. I traveled with him, uh, especially early on after I got saved. But, um, and then a current friend. They're conspiracy people. Right. When you, get, when you get into what do you believe or what can you believe, I think I already mentioned this before, but it's, I've, I've, I really began to look into why do people believe stuff that the common, average, common sense person would never believe. And I haven't got a total answer, but we're in the day and age where more and more, not even people that aren't conspiracy or what I call conspiracy oriented are going to believe stuff because it seems that it seems truthful to them. But, but with the knowledge and the internet, you have to filter stuff. And, and if you really want to know and you're not sure, you've got to do extensive research. Most people are not going to do that. Right. And I don't do it only for something that, I really want to satisfy my mind. Otherwise, I just go, well, might be, might not be. Or else you can tell sometimes right away, oh, there's nothing to that. But it's well, terrible because people accept stuff a lot of times just immediately. They just soak it up. Yeah, I mean, that's where it comes It comes to play that ultimately it, it's going to require you to, to believe someone or something or have faith, and then faith believes something as well. You know, there's belief in faith. Yeah. So, so the idea behind knowing you're going to ultimately have to believe something. You can believe not to believe that. You know, you can believe whatever it is. But, uh, but the truth is going to be true regardless what you believe. Yeah, the truth. And, and, and of course, <laughs> Well, I've noticed this in politics and religion, but religion more than anything, because that's what I focus on. When I say I focus on religion, it's how God began to teach me what, yeah. what I call the reality of God versus religion. That's just the way I term it. Um, term, 
That's my terminology. Sure. Uh, but um, the whole issue with all this stuff is the truth is the truth, but even, none of us has all the actual truth. In other words, God's, God's the truth. He has it. Potentially, we have it inside of us, but sometimes we don't, we don't necessarily plug into it. And um, so we're not even operating in, I guess, which we have the potential. We have 100% truth in us because God's 100%. But we don't have it. Nobody does. Some people have it more than others. So, and that ca that's what causes a lot of things. Some people, um, maybe let's say they got the truth. And, and sometimes I don't know that we have all of the truth, even when we get the truth. <laughs> but anyhow, somebody's got it. And then somebody else don't. And, and then what I find sometimes is that people are trying to convince this person of that. But the trouble is, the only way you can really totally be convinced is by the Holy Spirit within you. Well, that's, that's my point again, because like I tried to explain to her, I said, whoever lands on the truth, the second, if you can't say to yourself, I could be wrong. Yeah. Then, then you're done. You're, yeah, you're, that's exact. That's exactly right, and that's why these two conspiracy theories of mine. That was their trouble. Yeah, they never looked and thought, "Well, I could be wrong." They don't think that way. It's right, and I tried to explain that to her, and she called me ignorant. I said, <laughs> <laughs> "I said to her, I said, if you can't say you could be wrong, we're finished. There's no need to have a conversation anymore because." You've just put the door so tight into your system. And not only that, you're intolerant to if I believe something different. Yeah, that's a big issue with anything in uh, politics, religion, or any other subject that people are strongly opinionated. I was telling you, our family has always been very opinionated Strong. people. <laughs> and I've learned that God's taught me much about uh, opinionated people. <laughs> And I'm actually coming, what I call, I'm coming out of it. I'm, I'm so far away from what I used to be that I surprised myself. Good for you. because and It doesn't mean you can't have an opinion, but it's the idea of making that opinion essentially your identity. And that's what causes the people to, what like she called you, ignorant. She's identifying her own self with the opinion she has. But then here's what they also do, the liberals. They un they get well, to the conservatives do it too because I'm always always look at both sides. They, okay, they the well, let, let's say they do. I'm just identifying the group that does this, and oh, I, yeah. I forget about their name. But the idea is, if you'll see, if if they can't be tolerant to my belief, they'll go ahead and swing the pendulum all the way over to the other side and say. Well, that might be your truth. Well, I know it's wrong, and that's okay, but I believe this, and, 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 and it has to be this way. <laughs> well, well I, that, yeah, I know what you're saying. What, no matter what the subject matter, whether you're in religious people or religion or whether you're um, political or any other thing that people have disputes over. Yeah, you know, I've told people this before. I says, if you want all that God's got for you, which will be a process until you die, you got to have an open mind and an open heart. And what, when you say, when you make the statement, or, you know, not just you, anybody makes the statement, what you made that uh, uh, you might be wrong, that's the same. That's another way of saying what I just said. Right. And exactly. and I I know that many things that God has shown me and took me out of religion is because because a lot of preachers preach and sometimes it's an underlying preaching or teaching that invokes fear. They've got all the truth. Their angles the only angle, and they may not say that, but they'll pretty much demonstrate it. And it invokes fear that people are afraid to investigate something for fear the devil will get them or whatever i mean and, but, I, I, but i'll tell you what god's taken me into areas uh and shown me stuff where he had input into into certain areas where a lot of people they would just write it off and go oh no because they're too locked in they, they won't open up enough to you know to see to let god show them this stuff 
Well, watch this, because this is going to, now I'm going to, well, let's just pray for a minute, because I'm going to take this and tie it into the teaching for today. So, um, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. May we take this time right now, Heavenly Father, and just open ourselves up to hear, open ourselves up to receive, open ourselves up to to, to gain that prophetic wisdom that you have for us, that all knowing of all things that spiritually discerned, that we might lean on that understanding and not our own so that when these things come, which they will, and we have the opportunity <coughs> to look at your word and know all truths the truth that you give us, which sets the foundation for any other truth to stand on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. What happens is that if you don't have the Bible, the truth, which is the undisputed truth, the un there is a, a written word, which is undisputed truth. Jesus is the truth. And the truth will set you free. And free indeed. This truth, if you don't have that foundational truth, guess what? You, you can't take any other truth and weigh it on your conscience, weigh it on your heart, and disseminate it correctly period so what that means is i'll give you a group of scientific facts on a certain subject matter like vaccines which is what we were fighting about and for those scientific facts you're gonna have to because you're not the scientist you're gonna have to rely and have faith in their study but the problem is that I can also get a group of scientists that will completely use their facts with the same credentials and point it in a completely different direction because the way the world and this carnality life we have operates. There's an article I just posted that there's now saying Scientists are confused because there's evidence of a creator. And they're confused. About <laughs> they're confused. And, and, and they, it, it, it rocks their world. So what I'm saying is you have a group of scientists that are not believing a creator. And you can have a group of scientists that believe a creator. And they'll use arguments with the same knowledge or the same facts. But they'll come to a different conclusion. So because of this, the only way you're going to get set free from any of these arguments, whether it's whether you should be liberal or whether you should be conservative, whether you should, is you have to go to the truth, which is true whether you like it or not, and it has to be God's word. If that's your fundamental truth, God's word, and we know it's the truth, that needs to be the conscience or the apparatus that's used between your, your spiritual apparatus in some way to measure legitimacy, to measure the area of faith. You see, we walk by faith as Christians, and I'm really surprised the people that believe in, in evolution walk by way more faith than we do. As a matter of fact, you need a whole lot more faith for that to be true. So that faith, whatever that faith is, if it's not of God and based in God, which is the absolute truth, it, it to me, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. It's, it's not even, it has no sustenance. I don't need to even entertain it. And, and, and for that point, I don't need to argue. I can be peace and I can demonstrate through God and his love a heart 
and a passion that can open up and cause your opinion, your beliefs, to be bore witness of something greater than what you can ever think of. And that's the only way an unbeliever or a liberal, if I use that tagline, can understand spiritual things. Because they, their, their idea of spirituality is so long as it's enough that it doesn't get in my way. So long as it's enough, I can have enough spirituality where it's, I'm, I'm lukewarm and I love it. And that's in Revelations. God spits you out. Well, the whole, the problem is just it's just another way of saying it. Now the Bible says it is that their problem is that the natural man cannot understand or discern the things of the spirit. The natural man and the spirit are enmity of each other. That's why even ourselves have battles of the battles in the mind. Because even though we know that sometimes we're having this battle in certain areas, the natural mind and the spirit there's a there's a war kind of a warfare going on well that's their trouble if they're not you got to be born again to have the start of having like a lot of people read the bible there's people that could quote the bible better than me or you by far but yeah. they don't have any spirit behind it all it's more like a history but they know it but that that's a different issue. I know you well, know this, but they the, know it, but the, they don't their problem is they're not enlightened one one iota. That's right, because they don't know it. They and may, so because of that, we shouldn't I don't expect them to understand. I mean, I can't say that sometimes I haven't said how could they do that or say that? I say that, but I know when I'm saying that that really there's they, there's no possible way that they could. Right. It's like my brother, he basically claims to be an atheist, and I've been talking for years, and I try not to even talk about it, but, you know, because of, it's like anything that you're, like, involved in, in a constant basis will generally come out of a person's mouth, so I, without thinking, sometimes I'll spit something out, and it'll start, and, and we get along fine, it's just that it's not an angry debate that he gets mad I get yeah. we're, we're very demonstrative. Oh, right, right. But I've just kind of got tired of it because I've, I've, and this is what I've told him many times. I says, I could never prove to you that God exists. I said, because in my case, I always believed there was a God, but there was a 10 or 15 percentile. I wasn't, I wasn't 100%. The only way you can do that is to come in contact with God. Right. It's, whatever word. Well, I, t I tell him, I says, look, the only person will ever convince you is God himself because he's the one convinced me. And that's the way it is with everybody. Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go ahead and start our teaching today. It's a shorty. Andrew's got a 10-minute video here on the integrity of God's Word. The most important thing you will ever do for your spiritual life is to understand God's Word. I tell you, the revelation of God's Word is the single most important factor in spiritual growth. You cannot grow effectively or properly apart from the Word of God. Now, that is, those are some radical statements, but those are all absolutely true, and that's exactly what the Word of God says about itself. Here's Jesus speaking about the power of the Word of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29 says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and he should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. Now this is Jesus telling us how his kingdom works. And he says it's like a seed. There are so many reasons that God used this example. But I think one of the outstanding reasons is, is because you can't cheat on a harvest. You know, if you were going through school, 
probably all of us have crammed for a final at some times or another. You didn't really pay attention, you didn't do your homework, but the night before the final, you uh, stayed up, did something to keep you awake, you studied and crammed for a harvest, crammed for a, uh, excuse me, a final, and you passed your final, and it gave the impression that you really did understand, and yet because of the way you did it, just cramming it in there all in one night's time, you don't retain it. Many of you that have been out of school for a while can't remember some of the things that you passed while you were in school because it was a man's system and you were able to beat the system. You cheated on it. But you know what? When it comes to a harvest, you can't cheat on a harvest. You can't wait until the night before a harvest and go plant your seed and then just stay up all night long watering and fertilizing and taking care of it all in one night and see the harvest come the next day. In other words, a man-made system can be beat, but God's system cannot be beaten. You have to cooperate, and here is the reason he used that example of a seed. The kingdom of God is like a seed. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, that's the same chapter that I just read out of, he said there that the seed he's talking about is the word of God. The kingdom of God works like this. The word of God is a seed. And it's just like a man goes and plants a seed in the ground, and then he gets up night and day. In other words, this is implying that there's an elapse of time, and the seed just springs and grows up. He doesn't understand how it just works. You know, this is so encouraging to me, because when I first got started in the Lord, I remember one time I saw where I was, and then I knew where God wanted me to be, living a victorious Christian life, and it seemed like there was so much distance in between those two, that I mean hopelessness and despair just overcame me. And I said, God, how am I ever going to make it? And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you just take the word and meditate in the word and it will teach you everything you need to know. And you know, I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I can truthfully say that it's the word of God that has transformed my life. And this is what it's saying. It's just like planting a seed in the ground. You don't have to understand it. Mankind, with all of our knowledge, we can create something that looks exactly like a seed. It could have the same chemicals in it, be the same size, the same weight, but you put it in the ground and it's not going to grow because it's a man-made seed. We still don't understand exactly how this works, but that doesn't keep us from using it. Every one of us have planted seeds and seen something grow. It's a God-given principle, and if you take a seed and put it in the earth and give it the proper time and nourishment, it will produce of itself. That's the way the Word of God is. You don't have to understand this. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, but just trust me on this. Take the Word of God and begin to start meditating in it and spending time studying it and letting God reveal truths to you from the Word of God, and you will have effortless change. Mm. That sounds like a contradiction, an oxymoron. People say you can't change without effort. In the kingdom of God, you can. The only effort you have to do is to discipline yourself to just stay in the Word and keep seeking God. But if you'll do that, the Word of God will just automatically change you. It's impossible for you to keep your mind stayed on the Word of God and not get the results that the Word of God produces. Here's another parable that the Lord put forth in Mark chapter 4. In verse 14, it says, The sower sows the Word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. You have to put this together with Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, to find out that this first type of person who had the word of God coming to them is a person that didn't understand the word of God. The only person that Satan had access to steal the word from was people who didn't have understanding. You need to take the word of God and focus on it until understanding comes. There were a total of four types of people here who heard the word. Only one out of four really brought forth fruit, not because the seed was the problem. The seed had the same potential in every type of person. There are different types of people listening to me right now. You can basically fit you into four groups. You're like this first group that I just read about who hear the word, but you don't understand it. You don't apply your heart to the word of God. And so it just goes in one ear and out the other. And you know what? Satan is able to steal that from you, and you aren't going to have lasting change in your life because you didn't commit yourself to it. Then the second type of person is characterized like when you put a seed in ground, but it's real shallow ground. It's got a lot of rocks, 
and it just doesn't have any nourishment. You might see something spring and grow up, but it will never come to fruition. It won't produce its fruit because it just doesn't have the depth of the earth. You know, it's the same thing with the Word of God. Some people get excited about the Word and just immediately on the outward, it looks like that they're really doing well, but they don't let the Word of God become a deep part of them. They don't put roots down in their life. And because of it, they won't be able to stand through a drought. They won't be able to stand through the sun shining on it. It'll wither it and devour it. And there's some people like that with the Word of God. They just want a casual knowledge of the Word of God but they aren't willing to commit themselves to it. Then the third type of person is a person who hears the Word of God and is trying to let it have its work in their life, but it's like a seed planted in the ground that has thorns and weeds grow up around it. The weeds and the thorns choke the nourishment. They steal the nourishment that the good seed was supposed to have, and because of it, it doesn't bring its fruit to, to uh, completion. And this is the way some people are with the Word of God. They commit to it enough that they begin to start seeing fruit produce, but then they get care, caught away with the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things, and it chokes the Word of God. But the type of people that the Word of God really works for are the people who take the Word of God and nurture it so that it brings forth either 30, 60, or 100-fold return in their life. And I want to point this out, that the people who the Word of God worked the most for, the ones that had this hundredfold return, they didn't have more than all of these other types of people. They had less, less hardness of heart, less cares of this life that choked the Word of God from them, less attention to what other people had to say about them. Now, see, this really encouraged me because when the Lord touched my life, I'm uneducated, I'm a hick from Texas, I, I don't have much. And because of it, I was feeling like, God, how could you use me? God used this illustration specifically to show me it's not the people who had more who brought forth the fruit. It's the people who had less, less things to occupy and compete for the Word of God. And when I saw that, I thought, God, you know what? I'm not the brightest person that ever came along, but praise God, I can give you my whole heart. I can devote my heart 100% to the Word of God and uh, have it work in my life. And so that's what I've chose to do, and it's worked for me. And I want you to know that the same thing will work for you. God's Word is what brings life. There is no victory in the Christian life apart from His Word. I wish I had just hours to share with you about the importance of the Word of God. But the Lord literally, through uh, the ages, there's been people who've died to be able to translate the Bible and put it into a language that you could read. There's people that have been tortured. There's people that have suffered greatly, all inspired by God to do so because that's how important the Word of God is. It's not just a book about God. It's God's book. He wrote it. He inspired it. He had people pen these words. And inside of each one of those words is life. And if you will understand it and meditate on it until understanding come, that life will be released in you. The single most important thing you can do for your Christian growth is the intake of God's Word. Well, that was something about truth. Yeah. Yep. You know, something I just thought of was, uh, and I've kind of used this in my own mind, it's just my way of describing, but. Uh, Rodney Howard Brown, his ministry is ministry. There's a lot of things because not all preachers are just one thing, but his major thing is to bring the reality of the Holy Spirit to people. And of course, that's what happens. And um, 
he made this statement uh, a long time ago when I first got acquainted with his ministry. He be, and I guess there's two ways to look at this. You have to have the spirit to get enlightenment of the words penned in the Bible. But Rodney used this thing and talked about the fact that he just made this statement. You've got to have the word, but you got to also have the spirit. And I always stuck in my mind because way back then when I first came across him, he would talk about um, there's about uh, when God sent him to America and how that a lot of influence that he had came from preachers in America. They had these old real, the real tapes in South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But he said that there was the, some of the greatest preachers and teachers on the face of the earth in America, in the United States. And he said, but what's missing is the spirit. And um, so that's not saying that Andrew's missing the spirit, but it just, it's something that's unique in that when Rodney made that statement, I didn't really think that much about it. I mean, I remember thinking the word and the spirit, the word and the spirit. But there's other preachers that I kind of look at it this way, but there's lots of people that, maybe moving similarly to Rodney Howard Brown. But now that I came back into Andrew's ministry, because I was acquainted with him years ago, but I didn't uh, just like follow his stuff all the time, you know? There was a right. period of time that I just really didn't, had forgotten about him. Yeah. But now I see it's more real to me what, what Rodney made the statement of, because Andrew's main thrust is the teaching of the Word, you know? Yeah. Not to say that he doesn't have the spirit, but it's just that it's, it's that angle, and you've got to have that life and energy out of the Word, but you've got to have the Holy Spirit moving in the other ways and also incorporated in the Word to bring it out. And really healing or any other factor, that's what it really boils down to. You've got to have both working, and but of course it's not a formula, <laughs> because I've read the Bible for many years, and and when it came to my health situations, we listened to, I don't know how much, only God knows how many preaching sermons. And like Barry said, and I've went out to different areas, grabbing stuff about healing and listening and reading, you know. I have so many books on my Kindle, and just about every one of them is spiritual, and a lot of them have to do with the healing. But my point is that it takes both, but even when you know that, I know that in my mind, I've seen it in experiential stuff. But in other words, the Bible is full of everything about healing, and Andrew brings it out, but yet there's many people that are still not healed. And I'm one of them. And that don't mean I'm not going to be, because I, you know, who, who understands it all? I'm, I'm one of these kind of people, I wanted it instantly, because I've seen it happen instantly. So I become a, not that I'm sitting around impatient every second, but anyhow, the word, in the Bible, like I've put a lot of verses and saved them in this verse list I've got to go over and over the ones about healing and how Jesus healed all and, and all. And it's there, but yet, and it's not saying it's not having an effect in my life, but it hasn't had a total effect yet, you know? Now, but of course, a lot of people are in the same situation. Well, you're saying that when you look at it, what Rodney Howard Brown says about you need the spirit in order to interpret the word is what you're saying, right? Well, he never made the statement that way, but, but that's, that's for sure. You can, I mean, I tried to read the Bible many years ago before I knew God. I mean, almost everybody in America has a Bible. At least they did back then laying on a shelf usually. And well, I remember I'd pick the thing up and I could, it just was gobbledygook to me, you know what I mean? Until, until I was born again, and then, of course, the Spirit. That's when it started. Oh, and then I started getting revelation, you know? Well, that, but Rodney's talking a little differently than just the fact. I mean, he would make the statement, yes, you need the Spirit to get revelation and get the, out of the Word. But his angle was more of, yes, you got to have the Word, but you got to have the Spirit. In other words, sometimes... In other words, not everything that God says is in the Bible. He didn't say this, but this is something that's just I mean, apparent. That sometimes he speaks stuff straight to you or whatever that's a word of God, but it, well, you couldn't find it written in the Bible anymore. You know? It's a live word from the Holy Spirit. 
And he also, his thrust also is that moving of the Holy Spirit, to follow the Holy Spirit however he moves. But well, I mean, that's not exactly what we're talking about tonight, but I'm thinking about the fact of he's talking about the Word, but of course without the Spirit. And I guess in his mind, it's just, it's taken for granted that, well, if you're listening to that, it's going to take the Holy Spirit. And he even makes that statement sometimes. I mean, you've got to have the revelation, which really, when you use the word, you have to have the revelation. It means that it's got to be revealed by the Spirit. You might have read it, but it needs to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, it, he gave, it gave me a vision while I was watching this or listening to it too. And I'm watching my grandson right now, who's, um, he doesn't speak. He's only nine months old. And eventually though, he's going to talk. And how does he figure out how to talk? How does he figure out how to speak? I, I was looking at this thing about the scientists being confused about their needing to be a, dis, a, a designer. And because Bill Gates said something too along the lines of this, he said, there needs to be a, the, 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 the programming language in a DNA cell is so complex and they said that it's what we use for our biggest superpower computers is is infantile and it's like he said in order to understand the complex nature of that dna uh, in, in, in uh, language the, 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 the computer language if you will it would take like yellow page size um, books going around the world 500 million times, you know, and, and just more than, they, than we can imagine. So I look at this and I, and, I'm, and I get that vision of my son, my grandson, learning language. And Andrew said that, the sower and the seed, he uses this example. He said, well, I'm a little old hick from Texas. And I was encouraged by the fact when I heard this, because I don't have to, um, I don't, I don't have to get anything. I have to lose something. You hear when he said that? Yeah. He said, I have to lose something. So, you look at the simplicity of what God wants us to use. And as many conversations, he likens the kingdom into like a child. And, he, and this whole idea of the word and the integrity of the word, which is what he's labeling it, but what he's saying is that the word is important to be in you. You have to understand the word, be deeply rooted like that fourth person, only one of them will have fruit. Only one of the four seeds heart, which is basically the, the heart is your, is the ground, if you will, that the seed is in. It's your, it's, it's, it's what nurtures the seed into, I don't know how it blossoms, but it does the root and, and the seed. So, what I see and what really was amazing to me was when I started Bible college, everything about the Bible, like you were saying earlier, was gibberish. It was, it didn't make sense to me. It was like a different language. I didn't understand King James English. First of all, I hated, I never really did good in, li li in liberal arts or any kind of English and studies of Shakespeare or anything like that. So. I, I I never liked Rome that that language. No, I I I never did. Uh, my aunt got me a Bible when I got saved, and then very quickly I went and got a new King James. Once I understood, you could have another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I I the first Bible I ever had when 
I just dabbled in Christianity. I was still a very much a Catholic, but I was trying something different because I was bored with Catholicism. It was a new international version, the nearly yeah. nearly inspired version, is what Andrew calls it. Yeah, right. But, but the thing is, is that all of that to say this: when you, I I don't think that. When, when you don't have to call on the Spirit. I think the Spirit is calling on you. God, see, Christianity is the only belief where God's reaching down to the people. You see, all other religions, you know, Zen and Buddha, and you're reaching up to this higher thing, and you, you, you have to try to get to this you know, cumulata, whatever you want to call it, to, to reach that state. But, see, Christianity, and this is what I think the key difference is, my grandson will learn how to speak as we reach into his life and into his heart by loving him and affection teaches. Um communication is physical it's touch you know there have been studies about these orphanages in russia where no one touched the babies and they're suicidal yeah sometimes uh, a baby will uh, well i've heard it said that if you didn't uh, give some uh, touch and some to a baby it would actually die and yeah i've heard uh, that too and i know a little about it because my daughter uh, 10 years ago they uh, adopted this baby that a, a lady that was on, you know, a druggy woman gave this baby up for adoption. And the baby sat in the hospital, hooked up to wires and stuff because it had all kinds of problems for f- five or six months. And oh, I, really? saw that, I saw that baby before they adopted it. I won't go into the whole story, but that's sad. That baby was only thing that baby knew was beep, beep. Somebody's sticking something in it. Somebody's pumping something out of it. Something, and and that baby just said. But the nurses would take so many time out of the day and hold that baby, just hold the baby and hug it and everything. And but even that was a that was a relief from me. How the point is that little baby would have probably died if if they hadn't done that. That's right. And I really know that the way the Holy Spirit, and and if you read what the Holy Spirit is, Jesus said, I will bring you, he didn't say I'm going to bring you a Holy Spirit. He, he, I mean, he did, but he did elaborate later on and say those things, but he said it's going to be a comforter. Right. And, and, and the reality is that my, my grandson will learn. And, and this word I think as, and and again, even in my experience, when I started Bible college, it was gibberish, but it accomplished, you see, like it accomplished that to which it was set out to do. And that's what God says. My word never returned void. It'll, it always accomplishes what I set out for it to do. And so and, and it's like, just like a seed. I don't know how the darn thing grows. I mean, they can molecularly to the nano whatever create an artificial seed, but it's not going to ever grow. Uh-uh. That whole thing of breathing life into <clears throat> into into Adam, even that that's the only way he he was just a pile of you know nothing. Dirt. <laughs> yeah, he was dirt. some dirt, but he. When God, when that whole thing of the breath, again, and that was just like the touch. That was the the, the entire uh, heart thing that that happened is when life came. And the same thing is with the word. And and and, and the, I think really, as I look at this integrity of the word. It's so important to have a relationship with the word. I think, you know, we think a lot of people talk about relationship, you know, Jesus, relationship with Jesus, you know, and they have this abstract um, imagination 
of a relationship with the spirituality that they're contriving. Because the, the only reason why I say it's contriving, because the only way you're going to get that contriving action to really have truth to it and sustenance is through the word. So you need a relationship with the word, which is Jesus. That's going to create a, a more a fulfillment, a more fulfilling relationship. And that word, just like my grandson, he's going to learn how to speak. He's going to learn how to communicate. And your communication even, it becomes effectual by every good thing, you know, that you meditate on these things and acknowledge. You have to, I think this whole word, we listen to Andrew talk about how he buries himself in this word and he's really seen and has integrity, the word to him, because he's watched it. And he has, uh, he has that, what you were saying earlier before we got into the class was, if he's an atheist, you know, he has to have an experience, an experience with God in order for it to be real to him. Same thing with your relationship with the word and your relationship with God. Andrew had tangible experiences that he talks about while reading the word and, and revelation from wow. the word. And these experiences can only happen as you, as you acknowledge the word. Acknowledge every good thing about the word. Your communication and your relationship, everything opens up. You'll begin to communicate. That's what my grandson will do. As, I, as he reaches out and as I reach to him, because I got to reach to him, because just like your, your, your preemie or your, the, the baby that wasn't reached out to, it, 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 it the whole thing and God's reaching out to us. And I really think that you'll get an awareness of the comfort from the comforter. And that is called that unction. And that unction that you'll get will be the Rodney Howard Brown talk or what he was mentioning of you need that to get the word. Well, what's going to happen is it's been happening and it's kind of like, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? I believe that the whole thing is happening simultaneously as you're being reached on to and you're trying to figure out by acknowledging it instead of ignoring it. You see, many people who are reached out to by God, because God reaches out to them all. Every one of these seeds was being reached out by God, but the devil came to steal. Why? Because they were ignoring that whole thing. Your brother, or is it, yeah, your brother, mm -hmm. there's really no such thing as an atheist. No, I know that, but that's what he says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the whole idea is, it, there's a, there is something that is working behind the scenes. And it's all about our will and understanding whether we're going to allow it or not allow it. And that's where that whole thing's going to take root and take off and bless you and multiply in your life. And it's going to multiply in your life as you receive it. And the cares of the world don't get in the way. See, if you're focusing on the cares of the world, now you're no longer acknowledging every good thing. Right. You're acknowledging the cares. So you're going to get stuck. Your communication will not be effective. And that'll be a really sad day because that's, a, that's, that's what happens. And it's sad because I really see even, you know, when you're lukewarm, Francis Chan does a great teaching called lukewarm and loving it. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the teaching because it talks about, <laughs> he says, he says one of his parishioners came up to him and it was one of his elders and he was a little bit taken back by this. 
he says, Francis, you know, hmm. that was a great word. It was like after a weekend, you know, that was a great word you gave. But I think, you know, you're really fanatical. You're really extreme. <laughs> and, you know, some people don't receive that well. I think that you need to be a little bit more like, you know, like the middle of the road with some of this stuff. You, you're, you're, you're too extreme. So Andrew, I mean, not Andrew, Francis is listening to this, and I'm telling this story, and, you know, a little paraphrase here, but <clears throat> he says, wait a minute. What are you trying to say to me? You're one of my elders, and you're telling me that I'm too extreme, that I need this some find some middle ground here i need to turn it down a little <laughs> and he says to him like this he says wait a minute there's a narrow road that you know leads to jesus and there's a wide road for death and destruction but i never read anything about a middle road where is that middle road <sighs> And, and 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 there is no middle road. There's only this. I read the Bible. <laughs> right. So the whole idea of being this lukewarm, like kind of like halfway in, and you know, touch me, God, but don't touch me too much. No, I, I don't want too much. Uh, that might make you radical or something. You know, I, I, I'll I start to feel a little guilty, maybe, because I don't understand that. My world is has not been that way. My experience is not, I don't know, that doesn't, that doesn't sit well with me. Well, and that's what, really, it's sad, but I see, because people get stuck. I mean, look, here it is on... Um, eight o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night, whatever, every night. And it's almost like you can say that there's a wolf, you know, crying out from the wilderness, you know, like feel like John the Baptist sometimes, because it's like, there's a bazillion people that read and know that this Comcast is on. There, they, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook. 5,000? Mm -hmm. Golly. 4,000 and something. Holy. I would, well, I won't get into all that. They did a study. I mean, I know what you're saying. That's what they call it. But you can't even interact with 5,000, which I know you know that. I got 100 and some. I can't interact with them. Yeah. But the thing is that this message that when I set it up, it goes, and you know, you, you've heard of like some of these videos, they go viral, you know, millions of people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but the thing is, is like, who is seeking really with all their heart and all their mind? The Lord. Is it, I, according to this teaching, that Andrew just gave us, it's only about 25% if I distributed it equally amongst the whole field. So out of 5,000, let's just use a round number. Let's say I have 4,000 friends. Only 1,000 are seeking diligently becoming rooted and grounded with some type of uh, fruit. Yeah, you know, uh, that used to bother me a lot, but... It doesn't bother me anymore for the simple reason that I realized that when I when I had a rap, you know, they told Paul, I think it was Agrippa, I don't remember which one of them, told Paul, it says, all this learning is driving you mad. In other words, yeah, that was you're Agrippa. crazy. Yeah. Well, I was accused, I won't go into the whole story just for the lack of time, but I maybe one day I'll share, I was actually accused of being crazy and of course they didn't say it in those words but i was accused of that after yeah. um i had got saved because i had such an um, experience and it wasn't like paul i didn't see a vision 
but it said that he preached Jesus immediately. And yeah. And thought he was nuts. That's well, right. He had a summer experience as far as it happened immediately. Boom, I was on fire. And I didn't even know the terminology. But the reason that people are not is because, well, for one thing, I give no credit that I'm seeking God for 27 years to myself, maybe a little teeny bit. I give the credit that God, through different means, has demonstrated himself to me and drawn me. And it's, it's a, I could actually call him a detail. And a lot of people were sitting back, and I used to do this. I, I mean, I wished everybody had a tight relationship with God. Don't read me wrong, but I've come to realize that if they are not being drawn by the Spirit, and it could be the Spirit in me and you, or if they're born again, it could be the Spirit in them that's drawing them. And then, of course, they have to respond. So part they have of to respond because God's, God's pulling on them all the Right. They, the responsibility. But, one of the, but the point is that I don't really get concerned about it anymore. I used to be very concerned about yeah. that because I realized all I can do is tell what I tell. Yeah. And however they react is I have no control of it. I used to really get concerned. I actually, I would overly try to, you know, persuade and convince and whatever. And uh, anyhow, I don't, um, I don't do that anymore because I was about to kill myself in a sense. I mean, not literally, but just because I was expending so much energy and really, some of it was my energy, not that God wasn't working through it. But anyhow, the point is, and um, I don't know. I mean, it's just like healing. Andrew has all these reasons why you can't be healed, but he doesn't understand it all. I mean, right. he says that. Of course he does. Well, it's the same thing with this subject. I can right. tell you this, and you can tell me your angle, but I really don't understand it all. To be honest... To be totally honest, I don't even understand why I'm still going after God after 27 years. I don't have an understanding totally of it for my own self. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they treat, uh, they what treat. you're saying is true, and, you know, as far as I know, it's always been like that. Right. You know, I mean, and I don't know if it'll always be like that. I don't know the future. Well, uh, the truth. The tree doesn't, the, the seed here, no one knows how it happens. Right. No one knows how it happens. And, and I don't think we're supposed to. It's like we had this conversation the other day about, look, you don't have to know why the blood on the post of your door is going to let the death angel pass you. Just put it on. Yeah, no, you, you don't need to. Uh, and I, and the, the first experience I had when not understanding was, was how God led me out. When I had it, ran into these financial situations and had uh, no job and had no uh, uh, means of anything, and then how he led me. It did not make any sense whatsoever. In fact, uh, some of the people that knew the situation, this is a different kind of, they didn't say I was nuts, but they couldn't understand it. Well, I didn't understand it. I just knew it was God. I mean, I knew it as good as I knew anything, but I didn't understand it. I used to think and go, I don't even understand this, God. This don't make any sense. Because taking care of my uh, material needs was something I had done all my life. And now he's telling, now he's telling me he's going to do it, and all i got to do is do whatever he says. And he didn't tell me to do nothing for a long time. And here you're sitting there. Well, a guy that's so industrious and been working hard all his life, and you're just sitting there on your hands, in a sense, that's all I was doing, and that's what he told me to do. It didn't make no sense. I was just flipping out. To my brain, my brain was flipping out. But inside my heart, it was so nice that I had this battle. But I'm just saying, I, I, to be honest, I, I understand a little more about that than I did back then, but I still don't totally understand it. Yeah, yeah. You can't. The natural man. No, no, does not understand the things of the spirit, and yeah. neither can it do so. That's right. It's impossible. So, so, so why? And this is again. This is, gets back to that first argument I had with the liberal person about some of these intellectual arguments. You're trying to get convinced, and I think that's what happened. Even that thing about the scientists that are confused. The atheist ones are panicking. 
they're afraid. They they do not, now they're making up other hypotheses because <laughs> they yeah. they don't want to accept the fact that there's got to be a point. You see, you can chase this tail all the way down, but eventually there's got to be faith. And even though it's misplaced, oh yeah, it has to be. And, uh, it's got to be faith in, in uh, something. It's got to be faith. Look, God knows. Look, why does everything about God and why does he, why does faith please God? Really, in, in my understanding is you can't enter into a relationship with God without it. No, because there'd be plenty of things. There's plenty of things you don't understand. Who understands, quote, how they were born again? Nobody understands that. But yet we... But you know it happened. Every single thing, even healing. All of it. Yeah, who understands? You know, my brother, back to my brother briefly, you talked about the scientists and they were flipping out. One of the examples, you know, that... He's an analytical, he is a scientist. He really is. You don't have to go to college to be a scientist. No. I won't go into the whole story. I have some of it in me. It's not bad. God created, uh, not science, but the things that we under, the things that we understand truthfully as science, it's all God. Um, molecules, atoms, all that stuff. Well, my, I tell my brother, now he's very, um, our whole family's kind of like this, uh, different skills. He can make a, something out of nothing. Right. I say nothing, just a pile of steel, and he needs to make something to fit this. He can do he can do all sorts of things. And I have a lot of that ability myself. But I told him one day, I says, look, if you just threw a pile of steel and crap out there on the ground, I says, when's the last time you ever saw it turn into something that you could use? Now, you know, that's common sense, but he wouldn't grab that. I says, you had to be behind the idea that you made it. And I says, how do you think this whole work? I mean, I'm just telling you. You know, I told him that, and same, you would think that that would, uh, that somebody would just pause a minute and think about it, might realize, oh, yeah, no. The people like him, they're just locked into their belief, you know? Yeah, it's absolutely positively locked in to the point of eternal ignorance. Well... It's, um, we're not going to solve all the problems in the world here tonight, but we sure <laughs> are going to understand a lot. Oh, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. You need any prayer for anything, Sperry? Anything on your heart troubling you? Uh, no, not tonight. I don't, uh, All right. I can't think of anything, really. We'll just lift Jerry up again. She's had trouble getting on the computer today. She said she wouldn't make it. She'll try it again tomorrow. Who was that? Jerry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so she's, uh, I guess they're all the way through whatever the funeral or whatever they did, I, I'm supposing now, right? Yeah, it was Saturday. Yeah, okay. All right, so dear Lord, thank you for this time together and helping us and lighting us that much closer as we draw near to you, hallelujah, and know that, you know, we don't lean to our understanding and we just understand that, um, for the things you've enlightened us to. And those things are not of our own intellect, but they are spiritually discerned. And we walk into that with open arms. And we walk into that with a love that is just really noticing and really experiencing your touch as we start to commune with you. And we focus on just and acknowledging every good thing in Christ Jesus so that we can better understand and communicate with you and lead us closer and more intimate to your great ways and your great understanding. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Sperry, we will um, reconvene next time. Okay, man. All right, God bless you, brother. Bless you too. See you later. Bye. Bye.